Hello, thank you for joining Workshop 7 of The Black Family, united by history, restored by storytelling, brought to you by New York Life. The Association for the Study of African American Life and History, in collaboration with Archival Alchemy, presents this national program that highlights the legacy of Black family reunions while encouraging families of all backgrounds to build and renew their own familial traditions and stories. We encourage you to watch the rest of the videos in this series to learn more about oral storytelling, genealogy, and familial archiving. Once you view all of the videos, you could receive a certificate as a family historian from the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And now, let's get into Workshop 7, Recording Oral Stories Advanced, led by Ryan J. Hethcock. Ryan is a 1993 graduate of Howard University's School of Television and Film Production and specializes in oral history preservation through video documentation. To learn more about Ryan and his work, please read the full bio in the YouTube description. And now, let's get to the workshop. Hello everyone, my name is Ryan Hethcock. I am here today to talk with you and bring you part two of my presentation on video recording oral histories. It is my pleasure to be here again today to bring you part two. I've made um, some notes that I'm going to use as my guide to ensure I stay on track and keep us on time with respects to all of the different things we've got going on today. So with regards to my scripted outline. Let's get started. Hi there, I'm Ryan Hethcock, videographer for the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, more commonly referred to as ASALA. I have been in my role with ASALA, supporting them with video production since 2015. I specialize in the recording of oral histories of individuals, organizations, communities, and neighborhoods. These are all aspects that play a key role in the foundation of the family. And these are also areas where I have basically uh, met my personal interest and married that with my specialized skill in video production. Asala has asked me to share with you my professional and personal recommendations and experiences as it pertains to how you can become an oral history archivist for your own community or your own home. So in my first video, I went over the general considerations that you need to have that I felt were the base factors of what you need to consider before you decide to dedicate yourself to this exercise. And today I'm gonna to go a little bit deeper into the nuts and bolts regarding the execution of what you will need to actually record your own oral histories. So today we're gonna to get in some nitty gritty. We're gonna get into the, uh, the depth of what it is you're gonna need regarding equipment, considerations for the set that you're going to have uh, your individuals sitting in, and all the factors that go into giving you the best opportunity, opportunity rather, to record a clean, clear, and visually appealing oral history of whomever you choose to sit and talk with. I want to underscore that I promise you that today I'm going to do my very best uh, to not give you a long list of items that are going to require you to have to spend a great deal of money with regards to the equipment because of course you're going to need some basic things like a camera and possibly a tripod. Some of you may feel the need to go get some lights and some other specialized pieces of equipment. May not be necessary. It might be. That's your decision. However, because I'm going to presume that a very small percentage of you did not go to Howard University, did not study in the um, School of Communications, Radio, TV, and Film Department as I did, that, again, benefit of the doubt, we just want to get you into a place of being confident that you can do oral history video documentation just as well as I can without the degree. And I promise you, after today, if you make it through the entire video, you hopefully should have and will have that confidence and information that'll get you to a place where you can begin to build your own personal family history archive, okay? So let's get back to my, my script before I get off track again. So uh, today, what I will do is provide you with the basic techniques on the fundamentals of video recording and then share with you options that you have at your disposal when it comes to said equipment. 
And so while we're on equipment, let's get started with the obvious. The first thing you're going to need is a camera, obviously. And so what options do we have when it comes to accessing and attaining cameras that'll get us our recordings with respect to our oral histories, oral histories? So let's start with the obvious, cell phone. Everybody, most everyone today, either has or has access to a cell phone, whether it's through a provider, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, or um, a burner phone, or well, actually a burner phone, uh, more of an independent phone um, that you could pick up um, from a Walmart, AT&T, or Singular, or wh whoever is out there. I don't know all the, the brands, but the mobile phone today is more than just a phone. It's a handheld computer provides access to the entire world through Wi-Fi connection and internet. But more importantly, each and every modern phone from 2018 till today is equipped with a high definition camera. The cameras on these phones are amazing. They are absolutely the truth. Now, each camera on each phone, it's important to understand that you have the capacity to uh, do in-depth settings when you go into the camera mode. All cameras today, to my knowledge, are giving you the capability of filming in HD. HD stands for high definition. Uh, prior to HD, we were all shooting in SD, standard definition. No need to go into the specifics of what all that stuff means. It basically equates to the um, quality of the image that, that is being recorded based on the number of lines that it's reading to bring you the image. So in HD mode is where you wanna be. So to be sure if you are going to be one of the individuals who's just gonna be using your cell phone, there are two things you wanna do. Make sure that you're filming in HD and that primarily if you can using the outside camera. So oftentimes we take pictures like this, this camera uh, on this phone, this is the higher quality camera. The camera lens and specifications for this outboard camera is going to be better than the one that you got here when you're doing selfies. So the selfie camera by tradition, you know, gives you a, a good looking shot, but it's not giving you the optimal shot. So what you want to do, you want to flip the camera so that I'm seeing you from this perspective and I'm able to uh, zoom in. I can, you know, zoom in, you know, here and those kind of controls, and you want to be able to frame your subject in such a way where you have them uh, positioned just right. This feature allows you to do that when you're filming from this direction, okay? This is how you want to set your camera up when you're going to be filming. Uh, we'll get into the tripod piece later. Sometimes you have the option to uh, putting your camera onto a, um, a tripod that has a position so that you're facing your subject. Um, but we'll, we'll come back to that later in, um, in my presentation. But the camera is what most of us have at our disposal, and it's something that I highly recommend because it's easy to use, you're familiar with it, there's no steep learning curve, and at the very end, it's saved on your phone. Now with regards to the videos that you're recording or have recorded on your cell phone, and there's another device I'm gonna to, uh, touch on momentarily, is you wanna do your best after you've done your recording to take a copy of the video that you've gotten and place it on an external hard drive or somewhere else. Um, you always want to have a copy of your original. In case something ever happens to the original, you've got a backup. So if you've done your recording on your phone, you want to take the card that's on your phone or plug your phone into a computer and copy that recording onto your computer or onto an external hard drive. I thought I had one somewhere on my desk, but I don't. Um, sometimes they look like this. This is actually a brick, but a device that will plug into your phone and you just jump drive it. Well, here's one here. So for example, I could plug this into my phone and this is a, a memory card. And so the memory card, which plugs in here, I then can copy from my phone onto this memory card. And that's something that I highly recommend all of us do whenever we make a recording, we copy and back up our recording. In addition, um, if you're going to be using your phone regularly, regularly to make recordings, if you are using up um, all of your phone's memory, you are basically depleting your phone's optimal working capacity in that it's not going to be as fast or as efficient 
because it's having to go through too many different cycles, reviewing all that's on the phone, killing the internal um, speed because of the memory that is being eaten up by what you're saving. So even if you're just taking a lot of pictures, it's a good idea to back your pictures up to the cloud or to an external hard drive and then deleting them from your phone because it will give you the opportunity to have a more efficiently working mobile cell phone. That's just a random tip for those of you who may or may not know. Keeping memory available, at least half of your memory available on your phone will give you better phone optimization and battery life. Okay, so the next option I will offer as a recording device, a camera, if you don't have a cell phone, would be a tablet. Most of us have a tablet, whether it's an iPad or a reader or a Kindle of some sort. Um, these devices oftentimes come with cameras and they are also filming and taking pictures in HD. This is another option for you to have. It also, if you're able to get one of these backing things, you know, um, can serve as its own sort of uh, tripod. It'll be stationary and sits by itself. And so easily set it up and po position it in front of your um, subject and start recording. Same principle applies. Uh, if you're using this camera here on the outside, you would then have the ability to, when you have the, like this, like this, you can zoom in and, you know, frame up your subject accordingly. But using this, I'm sorry, this camera is the optimal camera that you want to use, whether it's your iPhone or uh, Android phone or a tablet or your iPad. This is the camera setting that you want. The rear facing camera is the better one. Again, HD is the setting that you want to make sure that you are in. Other camera options, let's see, um, you can go to any store that sells cameras. Let's say, um, whether it's a Walmart or, I don't know, Target. You can buy um, a camera like this. Basic digital camera, takes pictures. But each one of these cameras has a setting for uh, video. So here on this camera, even though it's for still photography, there's a setting here for video. I'm terrible at this. I'm doing terrible. There you go. That little uh, movie thingy there uh, denotes that it's for video. So by putting um, that, ta -da. I'm now in video mode and I can shoot video using this camera. This camera functions like all the other cameras. Uh, they've got a memory card on the inside. The memory card's not here. It has a memory card that you can easily take out. It looks just like this. In fact, this was the memory card, actually. This card here was in this camera here. Get it the right way. Boom. Boom. Done deal. So uh, by simply having access to a camera that's like this with the memory card, this is another option. Now, what makes this um, a viable option is that these cameras, so they are not that expensive. 100 bucks, perhaps. Um, there, of course, there are going to be some that are more and some that are actually less. But this camera does a great job with regards to capturing video. Um, there's no, uh, in the first three options I'm giving you, there's no external microphone feature. Um, a microphone obviously is what's going to record the audio. Uh, we're going to have a more detailed conversation about that momentarily. But uh, again, this camera is a great option because it's lightweight, it's easily traveled, and easy, if you had to hold it, you can hold it steady. It's not heavy at all. It's just a camera. And it works great, by the way. I've had this for years. I've been using this to shoot professional stuff for years as a backup to my other camera. Now there's one other camera, no, there are two other camera options I want to share with you as well. If you are interested in spending um, a bit more money uh, for higher end quality, you know, uh, looking production set, of course you can do that. This is my um, 80D Canon DSLR camera. It's a still camera, yes, but it has a, likewise, video record option feature. Okay, so I utilize this camera on many shoots as a video option backup. 
Same principle as this camera. You both set you set both to the film mode. You press record and you start shooting. Um, one difference when you get to this level is that you have the option of adding an external microphone. This would be an example of an external microphone. This uh, mounts on top of this camera. And let's see if I can do that for you. A live demonstration. A pre-record demonstration. I didn't. I wasn't preparing to do this. Let's see here. So it fits on what we call the shoe mount, the top. There we go. Okay, so it fits there, and it plugs in. Where's the plug? Plugs in here on the side. Killing time, right? And this gives you a bit more control over how you picking up audio. Uh, again, I'm going to go into um, the importance of audio in a moment. But this is just another feature of another option of camera that you have at your disposal. Again, we've got cell phone, we've got iPad or tablet, we've got a standard uh, digital camera that you can get from practically anywhere. And then you've got uh, this DSLR camera, which is a higher end camera, um, heavier, obviously, a bit more robust, but uh, a lot more features when it comes to the actual videography, the actual video uh, component that you're going to be recording. But again, more importantly, it now takes you to the place where you're able to do more with regards to your audio sound. Now, there's one more camera that I wanted to show you. Let's see. Do I have it here? No, oh, I do. For those of you who want to go all in, whether it's immediately or in time, you actually graduate to uh, a full-on uh, video production camera. And so this is my primary camera that I use for my video production work. Um, it's a Panasonic, and uh, without going into all the nuts and bolts, it does pretty much everything I need it to do. It's it's a it's an all-around uh, production camera. It's got um, um, uh, external uh, inputs for audio here, and there's another one back here. So these are two channels for audio. Um, anyway, it, it's it's big. It, it does a lot, and it costs a lot. If any of you have questions on which camera is right for you now or in the future, make note of those questions. When we do our live Q&A, where you're able to engage me directly, I'll be able to be a bit more specific and pointed with my recommendations and how you should approach your video production or oral history documentation with respects to what your needs are going to be. For example, how many of these do you think you're going to be doing? Uh, when it comes to when you, or if you decide to do post-production, you know, editing your videos, um, what are some of the considerations you may have with respects to what you're going to be editing based on what you've shot? Things to consider. We'll come back to that later. But I touched on um, the audio piece, and audio is very important. Let me see if I'm ready to go into audio just yet. Um, oh, uh, the obvious um, costs. So with regards to uh, this camera, you're going to cost the most. Your cell phone, depending on which cell phone that you have, that may not cost as much. But uh, for true, a digital phone that you already have and that you're already paying for um, is basically including the camera option. So this is number one. Uh, this would be number two. Or, uh, or your iPad or your tablet will be number two in terms of cost. But then again, this actually will probably be cheaper than an iPad or a tablet, to be quite honest with you. So don't sleep on investing in one of these because over time, it actually is going to be less expensive. However, you may not use it as much as you do your tablet or your iPad. So value for dollar, ultimately, perhaps the tablet wins. Again, all these things are for you to consider and decide on what's best for you and your budget. Let's see here. Um, uh, where am I going next? And in short, how much do you want to spend on the camera and then go from there? Oh, I'm right on track. Now, let's assume you've made your camera selection. So what do you need to consider next? Well, the second thing, potentially the most important thing, is sound. Right on track. What kind of microphone will you need or be using? All right, 
Okay, I'm going to say some things here that are going to seem a bit backwards and strange, but just stick with me. I'm going to read because I think I wrote this down pretty succinctly and I trust what I wrote and I can explain further once I'm done. So here we go. Well, there's a secret to audio I need to share with you now. And as important as it is to see the person you are filming, it's even more important to be able to hear them. I want to repeat that. As important as it is when it comes to video production, it is to see our subject, to make sure they're in focus, to make sure that we have them blocked where we have you know, all the thirds in, in alignment. It really comes to nothing if we can't hear the person that we're talking to. Audio is crucial. It is the number one factor when it comes to video documenting. Of course, you want clean picture and all that. However, if you can't hear the person you're speaking to or if there is an interference in the audio, instantaneously your brain just you know breaks its focus and will just be all distracted on what they're hearing as interference and not the person speaking you'll lose valuable you you will lose valuable information on what the person's saying or sharing with you and in addition you're basically going to lose your audience they're going to tune out they're going to say this is garbage this is jv now okay I, I see the effort was there but i can't hear what they're saying and they're going to walk off or they're just going to dis, be disconnected um, from what it is you're trying to convey through your video. So um, what do we do? What do we do? Well, here are a few tips I want to share with you when it comes to audio. I'll try to go slowly, at least speak slowly so we can all get a grasp of what I'm trying to convey here. Now, when it comes to setting up for your, your oral history interviews, you want to always try to be in control of the space that you're going to be conducting your interview in. What does that mean? Well, you basically have two options, inside or outside. I always want to encourage you, if possible, to film your interviews indoors, if possible. Inside is where you have the capacity to control the environment. You can close doors. You can stop people from coming in. You can cut the phone off. You can stop the air conditioner or the heater from running. You control the amount of noise volume oftentimes when you're inside. So be mindful. Clean audio is key. And the ability to capture clear audio, clean audio, is if you can control as much as possible the environment that you're filming in. Crucial, crucial, crucial. So you want to have an indoor space if possible. If you can't do an indoor space, you want to try your best to find a location outside that is less loud than other spaces that you have at your disposal outside. We're talking sirens, children's noises and sounds playing in the background, um, other ambient sounds, cars, traffic, etc. You want to minimize those interferences as much as possible because they will ultimately take away from what the audience needs to hear coming from the mouth of those that are speaking. Particularly if you do not have an external microphone. If you simply have the, the microphone that's available to you from your phone or from your tablet and you do not have a shotgun or a mini shotgun microphone that targets the person's mouth in the speaking area, you will have challenges in that regard with respects to getting clean and clear audio. So as much as possible, try to record your oral histories indoors. And number two, try to always position the camera so that if you are not able to access an external microphone, the camera is close enough to be able to hear the person speaking clearly. So uh, proximity. The closer you are to the microphone, the better I'll be able to hear you. So that's just basic, fundamental. The closer I am to the mic, the louder I'll, I'll be, the more you can hear. And hopefully this uh, microphone isn't providing any interference and that this conversation is being recorded with clarity enough for you to understand. Yes, I hope so. Now, as we move to wrap up, not quite yet. Uh, where was I? We, were, we just wrapped up... Um, Proximity of the camera. We want camera proximity so that it's fairly close to the person that you're speaking to so that they don't have to strain as hard and you can be assured that they're going to be heard uh, when they're talking to you dialoguing. Now, for me, I often use or utilize uh, we call lavalier microphones. 
Um, since I showed you the big camera, it's of course in the interest of full disclosure that I show you um, the other microphone options that are available to you if you're willing to pay. So I have here a uh, receiver and microphone option. These are Sennheiser microphones. You can Google these fairly easily and you can get a sense of how much they cost. Very expensive but high quality. So you're going to be assured that you're going to get top-notch quality with regards to the use of these kinds of microphones. If you want to explore these kinds of microphones more in depth, I highly recommend that you go to YouTube and simply do a Google, Google search on Sennheiser wireless lavalier microphones. There are plenty of videos out there of individuals who are using them on a daily basis who go into great detail on how you can access um, best um, usages or best usage on these microphones from placement of the mic on the shirt to how you attach to a belt buckle, things of that nature. So um, this is a professional option to ensure that you get top notch, top quality sound at all times. That is a step above the shotgun microphone that we went over earlier. So in the interest of full disclosure, those are all the major mic options that I would recommend at this point in time. There are others, but I no need to get into all that because it's just not necessary. So. Let's see, what's next? Oh yeah, so we're gonna get into a bit of what we call composition slightly. So the first thing I wanna mention when it comes to composition of the set, where you're going to be filming your interviews is to make sure that you are placing your subject in an area that is with them, not in front of a window. If you're shooting them in front of a window, you're gonna get what they call backlight issue meaning they will become washed out by the light behind them and the image you see on the screen in front of you, your monitor, will be dark. You won't see them. You want to put as much light, you want to have as much light possible on your subject. We want to be able to see them. I'm sitting right now with a window to my left. You're going to notice every so often that there is a brightness or more uh, dull because there's cloud cover. I didn't draw the shade to balance the, the light out because I wanted to demonstrate what it's like to film with a window. So with my window shade open, we're getting natural light brought in on me, the subject. So you'll notice that this side of my face is a bit brighter. This side is a bit darker because there's shadow here. It provides depth. I'm not going to get into all those specifics. No, no. Uh, all those details and how you can sort of dramatize, you know, your subject. But this could be an example for you. One side has a bit more light, one side a bit more shadow. So you're giving a sense of depth in the person's face. It's not all one sheet of light on them. It works, obviously, because you want to be able to see your subject. But you can actually utilize natural light to your advantage if it's available. However, remember what I said before, or I'm not sure if I actually said it. If you can, maybe I didn't, you want to avoid shooting close to windows, particularly if you live on a busy street or there are children in your neighborhood because you've got ambient sounds that could come through the window that you can hear and pick up, which could cause interference or disturbance in the conversation that you're having, which could potentially sully or spoil the interview or the content that's being shared. So be mindful. If you have access to a window, as I do, I don't live on a very busy street. It's not Thursday, so it's not trash day. I'm not concerned about the trash truck coming down the street making a bunch of noise, interrupting this video. It's not a thing. I have the ability to have my curtain open and have light come in to help, hopefully, make this setting a bit more um, alive than it would if it was drawn. It's a bit more you know, dull and plain. I mean, if it is, it is. But for the sake of me wanting to present my best to you, considering my tight office space, this is what I'm choosing to do. But for you, when it's time for you to dress your set or to make your set, be mindful of your surroundings. A, the light's important. We want to make sure that the light is on them or on their face where we can see them. We need to see their eyes, see their smile, be able to see their, their facial features and how they are responding 
or reacting to a particular story that they are recounting to you. Being able to see that is vitally important, and in order for that to happen, we need light. Positioning of the subject. Again, whether it's by a window or a light source, we want to make sure that we have control of the lighting as well as the sound. Is the AC on? Can't hear it. Great. Is there a child playing in the next room? Can we control that child? Can we do something with that noise in the next room? Is the television on? I've been in several locations during professional shoots. Hit, hit the record button. Getting into the interview, and all of a sudden, I hear CNN in the background. I'm like, oh my God. There you go. Right now, we have an inter interruption with respect to the fact that my... My fax machine line is going off. I don't know why. Anyway, love the life examples. This is what happens. This is what you might have to contend with if you're not able to control your sound in the room. So I'm being the bad guy right now. I'm teaching you by example what you need to be mindful of to shut down if you're going to be recording an oral history interview. Fax machine, cell phone, um, any other interference that may cause disruption in your recording, you've got to kill that. Luckily for me, this happens very rarely, but it timed perfectly so you can understand the importance of following these steps I'm providing you with today. And think of it like this. If I had unplugged my uh, fax machine and that didn't come off, then the dramatic demonstration that we just experienced wouldn't exist. And so the memory that you now have in your mind of cutting stuff off will stick. That's right. Fantastic. It's a great cover, right? All right. So what's next? Uh, so we've gone over placement. We've gone over um, of the camera uh, placement regarding audio. Uh, device resource. We covered external microphone. Yes. Okay. So now we're going to get into more composition work. So we are now going to talk about how we are placing our subject or how we want to focus on our subject with regards to the camera. So the expression I'm going to share with you now is um, something I want you to remember always. And it's simply this, line of sight. I'm going to read what I've written here because I think it's probably the best thing for me to do. Line of sight is the sight line wherein the person you are going to interview will be looking where they're going to be looking or where we, the audience, will see their eyes looking. So basically, when you set your camera up, whether it's your phone, here, here, or here, or your other camera, whichever you choose to use, we want to be sure that whether it's directly in front of them or off to either side of you, uh, who's going to be doing the interview, you want the camera's lens to be at the same height as their eyes. So we want to make sure that the camera's lens is at the same height as their eyes. Line of sight. And so if this camera is off camera and I'm conducting an interview, let's just put it right here for demonstration's sake. I want the camera to be focused where I'm looking right at it. So I'm not looking down or up, but looking straight on directly to where I might be looking at you if you were in the room with me. Does that make sense? I'll keep reading. So this is the goal we want to accomplish. In order to do this, you will need potentially a tripod where you want to adjust the height of the tripod so that the eyes are level with the camera. Typically, a TV screen or a camera monitor is divided into thirds. This is another principle where in which you want to gauge what is eye level. Okay, so a TV screen or monitor is divided into thirds. The top third, right there, middle third, bottom third. You follow me? Bottom third, middle third, top third. Okay, there we go. I got it now. Thirds. So, if you can envision that your screen is divided into thirds, we want to make sure that the eye level is always in the top third near to the bottom third. So where my eyes are right now, I'm in the top third of the frame. I'm in the middle of the frame. I'm at the top of the frame with my eyes. But I want the eyes right around here. You want the eyes right around there because it's a natural 
area where you want your subject frame for like a medium shot, but it's also where you want your audience you know, to see the eyes of the person that you're interviewing. Right here, eye level. So you wanna have the top third, middle and bottom third. So you wanna keep the eyes in the top third of the monitor so that you can have a sense from the audience perspective that they're looking at them, or at least looking in their direction. On an eye level, that is. So this is part of what we call the composition of our shot. This is how we compose our shot with our subject. We want to compose a shot where it appears as though the person you are interviewing is speaking to us at eye level at all times, if at all possible. Eye level with the audience. Um, subconsciously, it works like this. We're equals. We're equals. You might be Dr. So-and-so and so-and-so, but you're not talking over me. You're not above me. You're talking with me. It's psychological. Um, you're talking to your grandma. She's with you, loving you. As always, you're talking with her, your grandfather, your dad, your mom. You're talking with them, and they're speaking right back to you. And not just you, whoever is going to be watching this interview in the years to come. They're right there. It's a bit more intimate. It's a bit more connected when you're at that eye contact level, always. So let's see, that's a part of composition. You wanna always keep that in mind. Line of sight. What else do I have here? Um, so hopefully this makes a bit of sense. Um, for someone such as myself, who have been doing this for so long, it's, it's just automatic, but it's one of those things that you can work on and tweak as you go. Again, I, I utilize the um, feature earlier when I was talking about uh, filming with your phone that you can like zoom in Again, you can do that because the closer you are, you know, to your subject when you're talking like this, you know, the bit more intimate you happen to be, the bit more engaged you are with regards to what they're saying, because you're closer in on the um, the facial expressions, the attitude, the emotion. It's all a part of the psychological impact of what you're seeing and how it impresses you, particularly if you're able to make eye contact or maintain contact with the eyes. Windows to the soul, you're being able to see genuineness flow from the person, not just their mouth from hearing them, but seeing it visually, which is why I typically prefer to utilize the medium of video because you can hear in a recording someone's voice, but it's something about the eyes. The eyes don't lie. You see a person's soul, you see a person's heart, see a person's emotion play through their eyes. Something to keep in mind. Now, uh, let's see. Uh, I mentioned before that there's going to be a live version at some point where you're going to be able to engage me with questions. And I want to double down here if there are questions that are coming across your mind at this point because we're getting into the technical aspects of how we conduct these interviews. Please write those down. I can give two or three of these speeches or presentations on the technical aspects of video production, but I still might not be able to get to the thing you really want to learn more about. So getting your questions back to me helps me to drill down on certain things, certain specifics that might be more fundamentally um, viable uh, for you as you approach how you're going to go forward doing your oral histories. So please make sure that as I'm talking or have spoken, you're making notes and formatting your questions that I can address at a later time when we get to that part of the live um, presentation. Um, I mentioned earlier the tripod. Uh, with regards to tripods, you can find tripods in most locations that have that sell cameras. Um, depending on the size of the camera that you choose to use, there's going to be a difference in the kind of tripod that you get for this versus something like this. It basically boils down to weight. Weight is much heavier than this thing. And so um, that's going to pay, uh, play a large part in the kind of tripod that you need. It doesn't have to be fancy at all. But in fact, I... I had a tripod here. Um, I'm not going to go get it. But the tripods come in all different shapes and sizes. And clearly, there's one that fits um, each camera size. I promise you that. Okay, what else do we have here? Um, another aspect which is very important to completing our set is our lighting. As we discussed, make sure that with the uh, adequate lighting on the subject. And we talked about that already. Uh, be mindful that uh, a lot of our cameras, our automatic cameras like our cell phones, um, they adjust for lighting oftentimes. They, they call auto irises. So that uh, controls the amount of light that goes into or off of a subject. So oftentimes if you have an auto iris setting, the camera will make an adjustment. Um, but it's always good to help the camera out by providing as much light as you can 
and the auto setting will make the adjustment so that the uh, subject is not too dark and it's not too bright because there are moments where you got what they call white out or blow out where the subject is basically you can't really make them out because it's too much light on the subject. So I'd recommend staying off of the manual settings and allow your phone to just do its thing on automatic. And that's for all of these other uh, options. This basically is in constant automatic. And even this camera has an auto uh, setting um, on it as well. I don't use it that often unless it's an extreme situation because I like to control my aperture. But for example, this camera, uh, where it's green right there, that is the auto. My camera's not so great. That represents automatic. So um, I would not be afraid to utilize the auto settings. Do not be concerned. Auto focus, auto settings are your friend as you're getting started. Um, as you get a bit more confidence, you can certainly branch out and do more with regards to controlling um, more of those features. And that has a lot to do with uh, the composition as well as uh, dramatic effect or impact that you may want to add or not add to your interviews. It really depends on the nature and the style that you want to implement when it comes to how you want to present your videos to your audience. Uh, let's see here. Um, we're nearing the end. I mentioned uh, oftentimes with regards to the auto settings, they counter um, too much light or too little light. They'll add more uh, light in if it's too dark or they'll remove some of the light if it's too bright. And so that's why I would always recommend um, embracing some of the auto uh, features on your cameras. So uh, the fundamental basics of today I had initially entitled lights, camera, action. So we've gone over the lighting just now. Um, we want to make sure that if you're if you have access to natural light, wonderful. The best lighting conditions if you're going to be filming outdoors is if it's overcast because the clouds have basically dissipated the sun's intense light over the entire skyline. So you're going to have wonderful even lighting throughout the uh, time that you're going to be filming. If you're indoors, today it's been raining on and off, so it's mostly overcast, but for the most part, um, I've got even light coming in through the window. There's a bit of light flux. It's because the uh, camera on my computer isn't the best quality, you know, knock against Mac, but the auto iris is constantly shifting because I'm moving and the light on me is basically shifting as well. So keep that in mind autofocus that can particularly happen but lighting is key make sure that your uh, subject is in enough light where we can see their face and see their smile and potentially see their eyes if we're able to get close enough or zoom in enough to have them stationary to see those features in the face we discussed the thirds having the eyes in the top third of our frame at all times it just makes for a better composed shot better looking you want that. You want to be able to say that you sat down with your uncle or your niece or your nephew or whomever, and that when you shot them, they looked great. They were great on the day because this image will live forever. As long as we don't delete the video file by accident, it'll, it'll always be a part of your family's now new digital oral history archive. Uh, let's see, so we got uh, the lighting. We went over, again, uh, basics of composition. We have access to a myriad of camera sources from our cell phones to digital cameras to DSLR cameras to um, tablets and iPads. So again, because of the age that we're living in, gaining access to equipment is not a hard thing when it comes to the actual camera component. It's just what it's easiest for us to utilize. If you want to go into more depth and detail regarding what's the best option for you regarding the camera and the option for external microphone. Again, YouTube is your best friend when it comes to research. YouTube is your best friend when it comes to getting more information and best purchase opportunities. YouTube, 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 and of course, Google searches. Um, that also covers the um, lavalier microphone option that I showed you as well. Um, when I am filming, because I have uh, larger camera stuff, I do utilize headphones. And so I have a um, very cheap and expensive pair of quality headphones that I utilize. They're in bad shape, actually. So I can make sure I'm hearing my subject clearly. And so again, it's not so much the visual that's important. It is the sound of the audio quality that is critical and crucial. We need to be able to hear what they're saying 
even if they're slightly out of focus. If we can hear what they're saying, we can live with that. But if we can't, if there's a scratch, if there's a hum, our brains just don't allow us to process that, that information in an environment where we can be relaxed and at ease. We can always turn away, eat a sandwich, go grab something to drink, and hear the person from the other room and still get what they're saying, glean what they're saying, learn from what's being said. But visually, you know, we, we can, can or cannot live with it depending on the circumstance or the situation. Uh, tripods, there are many available uh, depending on what you're using. There's adapters if you want to put your phone on a tripod. There's adapters for that. I had in my desk, I don't know if it's still here. I can see. Yeah, still, let's believe it or not. Years ago, these were popular. They had these um, selfie sticks. You know, you could uh, prop this up. You just have it, you know, on a chair or something. Boom. Talk to your uh, whomever uh, using your selfie stick. I haven't, I haven't, put, I haven't utilized this years. Yeah, but here you go. Selfie stick. Boom. So tell me what you think about this. And this is it. They're talking to you. Eye level. Put this wrong. Right. See. You want this camera to this camera that you want to use. You want an eye level. So we're eye level here. Yes. And, you, and it's just pointed directly at the person and you're talking to them. And you have them talk to you and you just check, you know, what, those, what it's looking like. Go back to the interview. Make sure they're just focused on you. Tell them to, tell them to ignore this. This is just a prop. They just, we're just having a conversation. If you need to hold it, this is your option. Selfie stick. You check. The camera's still recording. Talk, talk, talk. It works. They have, uh, again, if you've got a standard tripod, just put the tripod right over your shoulder and eye level and press record and start the conversation. I mean, it's that's it. That's it. But remember, proximity to the person that you're speaking to, if you don't have an external microphone, is important because we need to be able to hear them. That is important. Make sure that we can hear the person that you're talking to. And what else was there? What else have I missed? I don't think I've missed anything else. I think we've got the, the fundamental basics of which you really need to be focused on when it comes to getting out there, getting that camera out, and hitting record, and getting you started. At the very beginning of part one of my series of this talk, was that it's important that you feel and learn and gain confidence in this act, confidence in this art, confidence in this exercise. Your confidence, your enthusiasm, your desire to sit with, be with, and talk to these individuals are going to win the day. It's going to make you the person that the that is creating this engagement the true hero because you're the one stepping out of your comfort zone. You are engaging the elders in your home, the elders in your community, the elders in your family, and letting them know this is important. I want to hear what you have to say. I need to hear what you have to say. And the children of the future generations need to know what was said from your lips today on what was, and what is, and what needs to be consistently and constantly in our conscious as it returns to we the people, who we are as a family, as potentially a family of color, survivors, those who've overcome, those who have achieved and will yet achieve more as we grow from our base, our foundation, from which those elders are, those elders are our foundation, and we go higher and higher and higher. This exercise, video recording our oral histories, is a testament to our desire, collectively, to enrich, enliven, and perpetuate those stories that help, help to create who we are today, to ensure that our tomorrow is alive, well, and prospering, because we are investing in their lives by recording our history today. Who will they be if they don't know from where they've come? Who will they think they are if they're not connected to the greatness that has been a part of their existence before they arrived? 
This is a part of the charge that we have been given for those of us who are called to this field of work. I want to congratulate you. I want to encourage you. I want to thank you for allowing me to speak to you, to speak to your mission, to your calling, to your purpose, in this exercise, in this moment in time. It is critical. It is important. It is necessary that those of us who are called to do this kind of work take it seriously, rely on our instincts, and recognize that this is not a mistake, this is not a fluke, but there's a time and a purpose right now for what we're doing because our kids, our future needs to know from whence they came and from whom the message comes from. Thank you for joining us for